Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this morning's talk. Uh, thank you for coming here. Uh, my colleague Brian and I will be talking about running MySQL databases on AWS. Uh, my name is Silesh Krishnamurthy. I'm a senior engineering manager at uh, uh, Amazon AWS. I run the engineering teams for managed MySQL family database services. So this includes RDS MySQL, RDS MariaDB, uh, as well as RDS Aurora MySQL. Uh, so in today's talk, uh, I want to focus on how you'll actually deploy and operate MySQL uh, in the Amazon uh, EC2 environment. So there are a couple of choices here. On the one hand, you can run MySQL in a self-managed fashion in EC2. And another choice is to use one of the different managed MySQL services that are provided by AWS under the RDS umbrella. RDS stands for Relational Database Services. It's a platform that is provided as part of AWS uh, that in fact provides the ability to run many different database engines. These include MySQL family database engines, uh, Postgres database engines, and also some commercial database engines like uh, Oracle and SQL Server. Uh, but in today's talk, I'll focus on managed MySQL family database engines. When it comes to using managed MySQL databases in AWS, there are a few very important considerations around uh, high availability, scalability, and monitoring your infrastructure. So I'll also talk about that. And in the middle, uh, we'll actually do a demo and, and show you how you would use the AWS console, how you set up databases, uh, and, and a few of the, uh, the various options. So let's start with a brief history of MySQL. So uh, MySQL is the world's most commonly used relational database. Uh, you know, back about 15 to 20 years back, uh, the, the LAMP stack took a lot of uh, uh, adoption. Uh, LAMP stands for Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. So people were building open source applications and other proprietary applications where you know, on Linux, uh, using the Apache web server, using MySQL as the database tier, and PHP as your scripting language or your front-end language. Uh, and there are tons of open source applications. Some of the examples we talk about here are the content management systems, the CMSs, things like WordPress and Drupal uh, and others. But MySQL applications are not just content management applications. They are used in, um, in social networks, in gaming platforms. Many of the, uh, you know, the big uh, social networks, even people like Facebook, actually run on MySQL. In terms of actual history, uh, there was a Swedish company, MySQL AB, that first released MySQL in 1995. Uh, initially, MySQL came with a built-in storage engine called MyISAM. And then somewhere along the way, MySQL also supported other storage engines, including something called InnoDB. Uh, in 2008, MySQL AB was acquired by Sun. Um, and in fact, in 2009, Amazon RDS, Relational Database Services, uh, the, the platform for managing database engines, uh, uh, it was first launched uh, with, in fact, MySQL then as the only database engine. Today, RDS supports uh, you know, about eight or nine different database engines. Mm -hmm. um, somewhere between 2008 uh, you know, and 2010, in fact, Oracle acquired InnoDB, which was a separate company, uh, and then Oracle acquired Sun. And so as of 2010, uh, MySQL uh, and InnoDB, all of this is under the stewardship of Oracle. Now, there are a few very popular branches when you use MySQL. There's the Community Edition and the Enterprise Edition that are both offered by Oracle, uh, managed by Oracle. They're open source. Anyone can contribute. Uh, and then there are, there's MariaDB, which is uh, a fork of uh, MySQL, which is increasingly having its own separate, distinct identity, although they strive for uh, a compatibility with MySQL. There's Percona Server, which is much closer to MySQL but also has a whole bunch of different tools and utilities. And finally, there is uh, Amazon Aurora MySQL, which is the uh, version of MySQL that's, that was you know, re-engineered for a cloud scale that we offer, that AWS offers as part of RDS. So there are a bunch of different options to choose when it comes to uh, using MySQL. 
So when it comes to an actual deployment strategy, there are two extremes. On the one side, you can choose to have full control. And you can run MySQL on your own in your infrastructure. Now, of course, that might be on-premise. But uh, in this context, people are running MySQL, say, on EC2. Uh, and on the other extreme, you can choose for minimal control and maximum automation, where the managed services do all of the heavy lifting. So let's look at the first case, when you are managing MySQL on your own. Now, if you have a very lightweight application, uh, perhaps something that's not used a lot, uh, maybe it's a test instance, then you could actually just you know, put the application tier and the database tier together and manage it on a single server. But as your application scales, as it starts to grow, as it takes more traffic, you'll want to decouple it. You'll want to scale the application tier separately. You'll want to scale the database tiers separately. So these two configurations, so in this world, uh, in this latter world, you would manage the database on a separate dedicated server. So both of these options really fall under the, the category of self-managed uh, MySQL. And of course, there's the AWS-managed uh, MySQL family. And now there are two categories. There's open source engines, which is uh, primarily MySQL and MariaDB in, in the case of MySQL, uh, RDS MySQL and RDS MariaDB, where we make almost no changes to the underlying database engine source code. We make a very small, modest number of changes, mainly around security. Uh, and the other option is uh, Aurora MySQL uh, that I will only spend little time on in today's talk. So now let's drill down into these two options between self-managed and AWS managed. Uh, in the case of self-managed, as I said, you have full control. You have control over uh, the server, the hardware you use, how you configure it, what version of the operating system you have, in fact, what version of the database. And you know, maybe you can even write your own code in the database engine. You're free to you know, do whatever you want. Right? Um, in the AWS managed scenario, the database is really a managed service. It's kind of like an appliance. Uh, so you can use this you know, shrink wrap service and easily automate it, uh, clone it, scale it, get high availability out of it. But you can't really control it as much. So that's you know, ultimately the, the trade-off. So in terms of control in the self-managed case, if you need access to the database host, you can SSH to the host and do whatever you please. You can change the, you know, the my.cnf, you can change various parameters, you can tune kernel parameters that you need. Uh, on the AWS managed database, you have no host access. You cannot SSH into the instance at all. All configuration is using the AWS API. In the self-managed case, you have the ability to run various third-party applications, plugins, extensions, um, you know, the full portfolio of what is available. Uh, in the AWS managed scenario, you have access to you know, well-supported set of extensions and tools uh, that you know, our teams have engineered to work well in our environment. Uh, and that's, those are the choices that you will have. In the self-managed case, it's up to you to put in your own backups and uh, restore uh, infrastructure. Uh, you also have to worry about, about upgrades if there's a security consideration. It's up to you to make sure you've got the latest version of the right database engine. Uh, if, there is, if, you, if your application hits some kind of a bug, uh, it's uh, you know, up to you to figure out what is the right version of the database which will not hit this scenario. Uh, in the AWS managed cases, uh, OS upgrades, uh, database upgrades are all taken care of by AWS. Uh, we carefully curate every new version of MySQL that comes out. We pick them, make sure that they work correctly in the environment. We certify them. Uh, we also are aware, because of what we see working with customers, we're aware of the kinds of you know, issues and the bugs that they face. Uh, and as we learn from that, we can tell maybe there are certain versions that you know, uh, you know, have a particular kind of problem. And we can you know, encourage customers to move to the right version. We provide that in a way we are curating the experience. Um, and of course, data backups and restores are also provided as a service. Uh, in terms of security, it's not just uh, security 
in terms of upgrades, but also in terms of who has access to the instances, uh, the actual OS level security. Uh, in the self-managed case, each individual customer has to, has to take full responsibility for security. In the AWS managed case, the underlying infrastructure has a high level of security built in, um, but then there's also additional functionality that is provided in terms of things like encryption, uh, various kinds of certifications for compliance regimes, uh, tools to ensure database security. These are all part of the AWS managed service. But I would say perhaps the most complex part is dealing with high availability, disaster recovery, and scalability. These are hard problems. Solving them right takes a lot of effort. In fact, that's arguably the primary value proposition of the AWS managed database, is that we actually have gone and built this all out. We've invested uh, in the engineering infrastructure to provide high availability at a cloud scale, to provide disaster recovery and reach scalability. And you can consume it with just a few button clicks or bake it into your infrastructure, into your automation uh, using the API calls. Uh, so ultimately, if you step back and look at it, on the one hand, with self-managed, you get a lot of control uh, and for various customers, that is the right thing. For many, many, many people uh, today in AWS choose to run MySQL on their own. Either perhaps they are running some custom tweaks to the underlying MySQL engine, perhaps they have the in-house expertise, um, you know, perhaps uh, they, they like the feeling of control, but then they also have to take on all of this engineering investment in order to make sure it works. And, and we have a, you know, a very large fleet in contrast in the AWS managed database uh, where you know, uh, people uh, get the benefit of us providing these infrastructure services uh, and you know, them focusing on, uh, on, on their actual application environment. So this is the fundamental trade-off. So let's look into what it would mean if you're running the self-managed configuration in EC2. Uh, the first step is to do the installation. You'll have to pick the version of MySQL that makes sense for you. Figure out which repository it's going to, you know, you're going to choose which, uh, you know, operating system that you need. Uh, maybe you choose a pre-built machine image, or pick one, you know, from the AWS marketplace. Uh, and once you set up the uh, operating system, the next consideration is around storage. Do you use uh, attached storage, ephemeral disks, or do you use EBS volumes? Uh, EBS stands for Elastic Block Storage. So there's some trade-offs there that we'll get into. Uh, once you're done with that, you can configure OS uh, parameters. You have to configure the network and security configurations uh, parameters. Uh, in terms of backup and restore, there are a few options available. You can use MySQL Dump, MySQL Enterprise Backup, and for Kona Extra Backup. And in terms of clustering and replication, there are you know, various options that are available. So these are all, anyone can do this running in EC2, um, you know, but these are, you can think of all of this as a set of um, uh, considerations to prepare for if you are actually, uh, you know, running MySQL in a self-managed fashion. In terms of monitoring, you can leverage CloudWatch for OS level metrics, and there's a whole ecosystem, a whole community uh, mar market of monitoring tools uh, companies such as Datadog and Percona, Vivid Cortex, Webio, these all exist today uh, to help make it easier to run self-managed MySQL. But in, in contrast, if you run managed MySQL, you get several benefits. First is you get high availability through automated failover. So you can run uh, managed uh, MySQL databases, RDS MySQL or RDS MariaDB, uh, in the multi-AZ configuration where you have multiple instances in different availability zones or data centers. And even if you have a failure in one piece of infrastructure, you can get a very high amount of availability by failing over to an instance in another AZ. Similarly, you can manage, uh, you can get uh, disaster recovery you know, by going to completely different regions and even do point in time uh, restores. If you have workloads that change and you, have, you want to scale your read workload, you can have read replicas uh, uh, and use them to manage read scaling. And you, don't, uh, you can set up read replicas, you can provision read replicas, you can add read replicas all using the APIs that are provided. 
So ultimately, things like provisioning, um, you know, scaling up an instance or scaling down an instance, scaling up storage volumes, uh, patching, upgrades, the general care and feeding, all of this will be taken care of with the RDS MySQL and RDS MariaDB services. Our, uh, the high order bit in the end of the day is you'll have, if you use the benefits of using managed MySQL, is that you get a lower total cost of ownership because we take care of the pain for you. Uh, we take care of the pain for you. You get more leverage from your teams. You can focus on things that actually matter to your business and you know, leave all of this uh, underlying infrastructure work you know, to us. Uh, story of a customer of ours, Flipboard, uh, which was one of the world's first social uh, magazines. From its inception, Flipboard has run its infrastructure on AWS. Uh, early decision was to use MySQL and, in fact, RDS. Flipboard uses Amazon RDS for MySQL with the multi-availability zone capability to store mission-critical user data. And uh, the big features that mattered for Flipboard included uh, auto minor version upgrades, automatic backups, easy restores, the, you know, scaling up your reads by adding read replicas easily. You know, all of the, the basic uh, value proposition I just talked about. Um, so now, in terms, you know, from now on, I'll, pro I'll, I'll focus more on the managed MySQL uh, databases that are available. So with, uh, you know, MySQL itself, the, the three engines, as I said before, are MySQL, the biggest size of the fleet, open source standard MySQL. MariaDB has an increasingly popular community. And, you know, for performance and cloud scale availability and durability, you can use uh, Aurora MySQL. So Amazon RDS for MySQL supports, we support uh, MySQL Community Edition versions 5.5, 5.6, and 5.7. Uh, uh, the storage engines that are supported are InnoDBA and MyISAM. Uh, version 5.7 has a whole host of new features. Some of the most popular ones include uh, support for uh, JSON objects. Uh, there are various improvements in the query optimizer. GIS extensions that enable spatial indexes and spatial querying. MySQL 5.7 has uh, provides an R tree as a spatial index. Improved parallel replication and dynamic buffer pool resizing. There are many other things that are there as part of 5.7, but these tend to be the ones that people uh, are most uh, uh, engaged by. Uh, there's a naming change in the uh, in MySQL. Rather than coming up, the next version was going to be 5.8. It's now going to be called 8.0. Uh, 8.0, you know, our, our work on that will be coming soon. In terms of MariaDB, today we support versions 10.0 and 10.1. Uh, in terms of instances, regions, pricing, it's exactly the same as RDS for MySQL. Uh, some of the differences are 10.0 and 10.1. We support the extra DB and area storage engines. Uh, there's a thread pool and GTID support. 10.1 uh, uh, had uh, various new features, page compression, data scrubbing in extra DB, uh, various query optimization uh, uh, improvements. Version 10.2 is uh, coming soon. We are, you know, we're working on it. We'll have uh, an announcement when we are ready to make that that available. The third option is Amazon Aurora. Uh, Aurora MySQL was built from the ground up to leverage AWS. Uh, it's a high performance database engine. You get up to 5x better performance on the same hardware, um, you know, over 100,000 writes a second um, on an R3.8x large, on an R4.16x large that will actually get to almost 200,000 writes a second, uh, 500,000 reads a second. Instances can scale up to 64 terabytes, uh, the database volume. You can have up to 15 read replicas. It's a highly available and durable uh, custom storage tier with six-way replication, two replicas in each availability zone, so across three AZs. Uh, there's various other features like transparent encryption for data at rest. There's also you know, pretty deep integration with the rest of the AWS ecosystem, the rest of the AWS services. So from store procedures, you can call into AWS Lambda functions. You can load data from a file that's in S3. You can load it directly into your database. You can, uh, say, select into an out file to take the result of a SQL query and dump it in S3. And there's many more integrations that we're working on uh, in Aurora. So uh, with this, before we move on to the next section, uh, Brian will do a short demo for how all of this works. All right. 
So I uh, just wanted to give you a quick, uh, for those of you who, who are new to RDS or um, uh, have used it for a little bit but have, haven't used all the features, wanted to give you a quick uh, walkthrough of just creating and selecting your, your instance. Um, so here in the RDS console, uh, this is actually a new console that was released uh, just uh, a few months ago. It's been rolling out to the fleet, so uh, you can switch back to the original console, but I think the, the new one looks a lot nicer. It's got some nice functionality. So we'll take a look at uh, all of my instances that are running uh, in the region. Console is region specific, so you know, picking a region here from the, the dropdown will switch over to your database instances in the other region. Um, we'll launch a new database instance. And uh, as Silas mentioned, uh, we've got our engine options here. We've got across the top the three MySQL compatible engines, uh, Amazon Aurora, uh, Amazon MySQL, and uh, uh, Amazon RDS from MariaDB. Uh, so, so we've got three. We'll pick uh, MySQL. Uh, you get a little bit of information about that here. Now, if you're just starting out with uh, Amazon RDS, you can use the RDS free tier. Uh, that allows you to run a, a T2 micro uh, for uh, 750 hours a month with 20 gig of storage for a year, so you can try it out. Um, it pairs up with the EC2 free tier, so that you can uh, you can run a you know a small website with a, a, a web tier and a backend database for free for a year to try it out. Uh, but we'll go ahead and uh, launch just uh, MySQL. Uh, we've got a, a couple of options here now. What this really does here is, is allows you to set a couple of defaults. It says, do you want to use this in production or using more in a dev test scenario? You get a, a full set of options. This just suggests some defaults for your, your instance. So we'll pick a production instance. So uh, as Charles mentioned, we support uh, MySQL 5.5, 5.6, and 5.7. You see here all of the minor versions as well. Uh, we release minor versions within generally a couple of months um, after they come out in the community edition. Uh, we don't necessarily release every minor version. Uh, if it doesn't offer any uh, bug fixes or performance enhancements for RDS customers, then we might skip a minor version. Uh, and, but we will release it, we test it, and make sure that it's working, and then we uh, deploy that out. Um, if you have auto minor version upgrade turned on, which I'll talk about a little bit, um, when a new minor version is marked as preferred, we'll go through and upgrade your instances so you get some control over that. Um, we'll go ahead and pick uh, 5719. And then um, under the instance class, uh, if you haven't looked recently, we've added uh, quite a few new instances. So up here at the top, you can see uh, so we've got uh, T2X large, 2X large. Those were released uh, two weeks ago. Uh, as well as the M4 16x large. That's uh, 64 vCPUs, so the top end of the M4 family. Uh, and then we release support for the R4 family as well. So all the way from R4 large to 16x large. So 64 vCPUs and a half a terabyte of RAM. If you need a very sizable uh, MySQL server, uh, then you can pick that one. I'm not going to go up quite that big. We'll just pick a, a T2 2x large. Um, you have the option here to go ahead and create uh, the multi-AZ deployment, so create a standby uh, instance in a secondary zone for failovers. Uh, you can add this later if you chose to go with a single AZ configuration. Uh, you can go later to a multi-AZ configuration. Uh, and then you pick your storage types. Uh, either You want to either pick GP2, which is our general purpose SSD, or provisioned IOPS. Provisioned IOPS gives you guaranteed IOPS performance here. Um, so uh, with either one, we can go up to now uh, 16 terabytes of storage. Uh, that was also released in the last couple of weeks. Uh, we used to have a six terabyte limit for RDS, uh, MySQL, and MariaDB. Um, Amazon Aurora goes up to 64 terabytes, uh, grows up automatically, uh, but this is for our, our uh, open source engines. We just added 16 terabyte support, so I can pick uh, five terabytes. There we go. Uh, let's give it a name. Uh, let's call it reInvent. And give it some. So we create the uh, initial master user for you that you could log on and then provision other uh, database users with uh, that administrative account. Um, so you can, if you're just starting out with um, RDS, you can go through, most of these will default, but you can um, also choose um, a subnet group. Subnet groups are used to determine um, uh, which AZs and which subnets you're going to use, and it's important when you're doing a multi-AZ configuration uh, to make sure that you have uh, a subnet group with 
uh, multiple AZs, uh, availability zones in it. Um, your security group is going to determine um, what uh, uh, instances, what other uh, machines have access to your database. So think of it as sort of IP firewall. Um, you can either pick a new one or you can select from an existing uh, security group. Um, uh, you can set, if, you, if you're using a parameter group, so parameters are groups are commonly used parameters, so if you've got a configuration that's a standard configuration, you can pick that here. Um, you can enable encryption. It's just a, a button click. Uh, now, you, you generally, I would actually uh, like to change this so we opt encryption on by default. It should be on by default. Um, if you choose not to do encryption later, um, to encrypt an instance, you actually have to take a back of it encrypt the backup and then restore the backup. So um, if you're, you're going to use encryption, which we, uh, we do recommend, uh, go ahead and select it here from uh, the startup here. Set your, uh, your backup window. This is your automated backup window, so it means that within seven days, I can do a point in time restore to any five minute period within that seven days. I can go back three days and two hours and 12 minutes uh, and uh, restore my backup uh, within that window and then it will age out the backups. So I could go up to a maximum of 35 days. Uh, here we'll just pick it seven. Um, enhanced monitoring gives you uh, additional access to uh, a lot of new, uh, a lot of metrics, uh, what we collect on the, the database hosts. I uh, encourage you to keep that on. I'll show you where that shows up. And then I mentioned the minor version upgrade. So a minor version upgrade, as we release new minor versions of MySQL or MariaDB, um, we will uh, automatically upgrade your database instance uh, within the maintenance window. And the maintenance window is your once a week uh, uh, window here where we do perform any disruptive maintenance. Now, you specify it once a week, that doesn't mean we use it every week. We actually only use it a few times a year, uh, but when we do have maintenance that requires the database disruption, it will go in that maintenance window. Um, and you can pick um, a specific day of the week, a specific start time, and, and uh, any maintenance operations that we're going to do will show up in your uh, personal health dashboard, uh, which is available in the console. You'll see a, a, a notification there, and we'll tell you the instances that we're uh, going to do uh, maintenance on. So we'll go ahead and uh, pick that, and then launch your database instance. This usually takes uh, around five to, to ten minutes to go, go out and we get a, a, an instance from EC2. We attach a storage volume, we install the database, uh, and, uh, and set up the security parameters, uh, all of the things uh, that you need. You can see here, we go now back to that instance. It's in the uh, creation status. You don't actually pay for it. You don't start getting metered for it until uh, it is ready to, to access. Um, and you can see here the, the summary here. I'm going to go just quick back to the dashboard here. You can see this. we're still creating this one. Um, but I'll go into one that I've uh, created before. We'll drill down into one that's already up and running. Uh, you can see the, uh, it's a 5719. And here you see some of the CloudWatch metrics that we support. So you're looking at utilization. This database is not doing much. Connections, free storage space. Um, you can configure this and you can say, I want to see more metrics, fewer metrics. Um, you can add other metrics. Oops. So you can see, uh, filter out different metrics. So lots of uh, information about your, your database. Uh, also here, if you've got enhanced monitoring turned on, remember the flag that I set in uh, the instance creation. Uh, you can see uh, enhanced monitoring here, and you get additional, a uh, whole bunch of additional metrics here. So you come up, you can see all the information that you might want to display about your database instance to make sure that it's running and, and healthy. So that's an enhanced monitoring. And you can get also a nice uh, process list here with uh, what's running on the, uh, the database instance. So just a quick tour of uh, sort of getting started with uh, uh, RDS uh, MySQL. Uh, very similar process for uh, RDS MariaDB and uh, Amazon Aurora. So uh, I think we'll talk about some best practices. Thanks, Brian. So let's start with how you actually migrate your data into AWS. So you have a few options here. And um, I'll actually, in this case, I'll also talk about uh, how you would migrate your data uh, if you're running your own uh, EC2 instance. So one way to think about it first is, are you, getting, are you doing a homogeneous migration or a heterogeneous migration? If your source database is also MySQL, 
uh, life is going to be much easier. You are going to be able to find ways. There are different options in which you can take your database and move it in. You know, if you're running self-managed MySQL on EC2, uh, the simplest thing to do is to take a logical dump. You can run MySQL dump uh, on your source database and then do a MySQL, MySQL import and uh, load that database logically into your, uh, into your instance. Now, a typical best practice if you're having a live application is to actually uh, set up external replication into your instance on EC2 uh, and then go you know, test your, your newly created replica, let it catch up, uh, test maybe start diverting your read workload onto your new target that you've set up, you've imported in, and once you've convinced yourself that everything is working well and you've tested it, then you actually cut over your write traffic also, uh, and that way you can minimize downtime. Now, if you're having, if you're coming in from a non-MySQL database, so this is the heterogeneous migration. Maybe you have uh, a SQL Server or DB2 or an Oracle database. Then you could choose to use the AWS database migration service uh, to bring the data uh, to MySQL uh, from your other, from your source database. There's also the case of something that we call database consolidation. Uh, in any given MySQL database instance, you have several databases. Uh, and if you had you know, five databases in your original source and you want to bring all those five databases into your target, you know, that's one case. Right? That's kind of like the homogeneous case. But maybe I had 20 different ETBT MySQL databases, each with you know, instances, each with two databases. I want to bring you know, all those 40 databases into a single you know, bigger instance that I'm running in EC2, uh, that's more like database consolidation where you're bringing more of the data in. You can do that using uh, logical um, migration, uh, logical import using things like MySQL dump, but that's also a good case for using uh, the database migration service. So I would recommend using uh, database migration service either for heterogeneous migrations or for database consolidation. But if you're using uh, the managed MySQL uh, family, RDS MySQL or RDS MariaDB, uh, there's another interesting option. There is, uh, which is just released, uh, to actually import a backup to do a physical migration. So let's say you're running MySQL already in a self-managed fashion or on-premise or something. Um, what you can do is take you know, a full or an incremental backup, use the Percona Extra Backup tool, uh, and get your, you know, your, your full backup of your uh, MySQL, your source MySQL database. Uh, copy it to a bucket in S3, the whole backup. Uh, use an IAM role to create an IAM role to access that bucket and push that IAM role to, the, to your new, uh, to your RDS MySQL uh, uh, system. Uh, and use that to actually restore your actual database the physical bits, the physical snapshot that you took on your source database, restore it directly into an RDS database, into an Amazon RDS database. Um, so in most cases, if you're doing this physical migration, you will get a much shorter uh, migration time. Uh, you won't have to rebuild all the indexes because all the indexes will already exist. Uh, you will just be able to copy all of the data in. And even, even you know, loading the data, you're actually going to copy the data in their B-trees in their actual uh, configuration that, that was running before. Um, so uh, importing uh, databases, importing the physical snapshot uh, was available in RDS or, uh, Aurora MySQL for uh, almost a year now, and it's now available for RDS MySQL also. Uh, the general technique here is to use, again, replication to catch up to changes. So what we recommend is to actually turn on binary log, bin log replication in your source database before you take your backup, uh, and then upload your backup and restore it into your uh, RDS instance. Uh, once the RDS instance comes up, you can set the newly created RDS instance as a replication target, so you'll have your bin log position that's available. Set it as a replication target from the source database that's running you know, on-prem, and then catch up to the changes, uh, and then use the same technique I described about before. Uh, you know, test your, try to cut over your read workload, test it, make sure you do your due diligence, make sure everything's working correctly, and then cut over your writes. Uh, so this technique will, you know, works remarkably well. 
um, and you know we have uh, you know uh, found it very useful in uh, RDS Aurora MySQL. So we think people uh, who are going to RDS MySQL will also benefit from it. Now, separate from database migration, another common idiom is to do data loads. Sometimes you have data loads that you're you're you know loading in maybe every few hours. You're loading a bunch of data. Um, in this scenario, you can't actually use physical migration. You may also not be able to use database migration services because you're just taking a bunch of uh, maybe uh, logs that you want to load or a bunch of other data sets that you want to load. And when you're doing these bulk uploads, some of the techniques that we uh, suggest is to turn off backup retention, to disable bin log replication, uh, turn off auto commit, drop your indexes temporarily. It may make sense based on what you're trying to do to rebuild the indexes after, after you've done your load. Uh, this is especially true if you're loading each of these files into separate partitions, for instance. You can disable foreign key checks. That may be necessary because you're loading data into multiple tables of a, a parent-child for, you know, foreign key hierarchy. If you're using an EBS-based engine, you would want to use, you would want to maximize your storage IOPS configurations. Similarly, there are certain parameter settings that you would want to tweak, uh, things like flush log or transaction commit, uh, your, I, your uh, write threads and your read threads. Now, once you're done with these kind of data loading operations, it's important to actually switch back to your normal configuration. So what we are, uh, what we are suggesting, what, we've, what people have found useful is you know, try to treat data loading as a special kind of operation uh, provided you know, that fits in the schedule, how often you're going to see it, uh, and build some automation, some infrastructure around data loading uh, that will get you better performance. Because in the end of the day, you want to shrink that data loading time so that you can spend your time more productively with you know, your actual application. Uh, so in terms of best practices uh, on the managed RDS MySQL and MariaDB, uh, three big things are, and, and uh, you know, Brian went over two of them in the demo. Um, you know, leveraging the multi-availability zone configuration for high availability, and he also talked about enhanced monitoring. Uh, and there's also read replicas. So with read replicas, you can get read scalability, but you can also get disaster recovery to a completely different region. Uh, it also helps with things like upgrades. So now I'll spend some time talking about each of these uh, best practices. So let's start with <coughs> multi-AZ high availability. Um, so, let me first very carefully define what an availability zone is. In AWS parlance, uh, you can have multiple different availability zones or AZs in any given geographical region. Uh, each AZ is physically distinct infrastructure that's different from other AZs in the region. In fact, each AZ is you know, about 5 to 15 miles uh, from another AZ in the same region. Uh, the way multi-AZ works, the way all of the RDS instances work, is with uh, managed uh, EBS volumes for storage. So you would set up uh, an instance in one availability zone, and there would be a standby instance with the database engine binaries, everything ready to go on another AZ. And at the storage level, we replicate the EBS volume across both AZs. So every write that's happening in your primary instance is being replicated synchronously to your secondary instance, which is in another AZ. In, in case of any kind of you know, failure or any kind of issue, if you have a host replacement or you have a problem with your primary EBS volume, our infrastructure will automatically detect this and fail over to your secondary instance. Your application does not have to change because your application is talking to a DNS entry. And as part of the failover logic, we update the DNS entry so that the application is automatically now talking to the secondary, you know, what was the, until now the secondary instance. So the old secondary will become the new primary. You'll have the database will restart and crash recovery will happen, uh, but you know, your, the actual storage volume is synchronously available immediately on that other instance. So in general, you know, with multi-AZ, uh, you will see uh, failover durations of you know, between you know, uh, one to two minutes, typically. Right? So normally, that's, the, that's what you should be budgeting for. And that's important because you know, while you get high availability with the multi-availability zone configuration, 
it's still very important at the application tier to be cognizant that these things can happen. You could have an EC2 failure, you could have a host replacement. It's still very important in the application tier to be able to deal with these things. Because when, when you have a failover, your application, your connections snap. Your, even if you have a connection pool, all of a sudden your connections break. And certainly we've seen situations where you would have uh, you know, a customer application uh, which is, is very sensitive to these connection failures. Uh, and oftentimes in, in, in applications you will have, uh, you know, failures will start cascading upstream. You may have some kind of a queuing system, then the queuing system, you know, things start building up in that queuing system. Uh, upstream from that, your application may start getting overloaded, connections start, get, start piling up. So it's important to, when you use multi-AZ high availability to recognize exactly what you get. What you get is high availability, high durability of the storage volumes. They do not inoculate you from, uh, say, MySQL bugs that are in the database side. Uh, and they also do not protect you from dealing with these kinds of issues. When there's failures, you will have your application will snap connections and your application needs to be aware of that and built with a way that you, know, you can make sure uh, you're able to reconnect even in terms of when you have a failure or you have a blip. Uh, all in all, MySQL multi-AZ high availability uh, offers a huge amount of value but I just want to emphasize that it's important to do your own diligence to make sure your application infrastructure uh, works well with it. You can simulate the failovers, so it's a good way before going production to make sure you know what is the impact of the failover to your application environment. Um, some, some tips, I think um, Brian talked about in his demo, he showed how you can pick a single AC instance and then you can convert it to becoming a multi-AZ instance. Um, so it's, you know, from a, from, from a production perspective, we actually recommend, you know, going, switching from single AZ to multi-AZ before you go into production. Uh, and the reason is that you know, when you actually create that multi-AZ, you're creating a mirror of that EBS volume, the underlying EBS volume. Uh, it takes some time to hydrate that and to get uh, good performance on it. So if you are suddenly creating, you know, a, a multi-AZ, you're promoting a single AZ instance to become a multi-AZ instance, uh, then not only will it take time for that multi-AZ volume to become ready, it can also impact some perf impact your performance of your actual single a of your primary instance while that happens. So we strongly recommend that you consider multi-AZ and, you know, in fact, strongly recommend that you use it and, uh, and configure and set it up before you go into production. So um, a couple of things to remember is uh, commit latencies because uh, every write is now actually being ha is happening not just to the local EBS volume in your AZ but also to another EBS volume that's in another AZ. And in fact, even in your local EBS volume, under the covers, EBS has a, you know, a primary and a secondary. So your writes, instead of writing to two sets of uh, storage nodes, are actually going to four sets of storage nodes. So that's an extra commit latency. And in terms of, you know, if you're trying to maximize your IOPS, on a multi-AZ instance configuration, you'll get typically a little lower amount of uh, max IOPS you can sustain compared to a single AZ instance. Um, with, you can also get a multi-AZ configuration with uh, Amazon Aurora. Uh, it's a, a different model of um, multi-AZ um, uh, availability. You, uh, Aurora actually replicates the underlying storage tier six ways with two copies in each availability zone. Your additional multi-AZ instance is not just a standby instance. So in uh, normal multi-AZ, your, uh, your second instance that's running in the other AZ is a standby instance. It's not actually serving any traffic. Whereas in Aurora, your multi-AZ instances can actually serve read traffic. They can't serve writes, but they can serve read traffic. Failovers are pretty fast, uh, are, are faster than with, um, with MySQL, MariaDB, instead of you know, about a minute, they are typically under 30 seconds. Uh, you can also pick amongst your different active read replicas, your active instances, which you should uh, promote as your new writer in the case of a failure. So these are some options when it comes to multi-availability zone uh, configurations. 
So there's another option, which is, uh, you know, not, it's, it's not uh, an either or. Many people can also, in addition to using multi-AZ, uh, will also choose to do, to set up read replicas for horizontal scaling. Uh, so the idea here is you, from your actual multi-AZ or single AZ instance, you can set up bin log replication and replicate to another database and uh, instance um, which this has to be a single AZ instance. So you, you can configure this config, you know, this setup through the API. You can create a new read replica. Uh, this will have a completely independent, completely separate storage volume, and all your writes that are happening on your primary instance will be replicated to your read replicas. The the big use case of using read replicas is horizontal scaling horizontal scaling of your read heavy workloads. So typically people have many more reads than writes. Uh, you can start you can in your application you can configure and you can configure uh, the read workloads to point to the read replicas. Now some of the challenges are that your read replicas can start lagging depending on your write workload, uh, and so it's up to you to figure out from the constraints of your application, what your actual lag is going to be. Can your application tolerate that kind of lag in, in, its, uh, in its read workload? Now, if your read replica falls too far behind, it's easy to recreate it, so there's no issues with, with that. Another kind of variant of using read replicas is to use the cross-region read replicas. Uh, in this case, you can set up, say, your primary instance uh, let's say in, in US East 1 in Virginia, and you can create a cross-region read replica by having a replica set up, say, in US West 1 in, in Portland. Uh, and come up, the big use cases of using cross-region read replica. First is uh, you may have your application with, you know, with uh, reads in different regions, and you might want to get your application, your, uh, your database replica, your readers closer to where your application is, so that's one big use case. And the other use case is for disaster recovery. Um, if, you, if there's a catastrophic event in any given region, you can quickly promote the read replica in another region to be a master if, if you need to. Um, with Aurora's read replicas, Aurora's read replicas are actually some, you know, more in some ways more like it's a mixture of what you get with uh, horizontal scaling with MySQL read replicas as well with multi-AZ. You get the, the, the read replicas serve as both failover targets, uh, but they all use shared storage, so you're not having a second, you're not having an additional storage volume for each of your replicas. Uh, so, so my advice is, is to treat read replicas on MySQL and MariaDB uh, separately from, uh, you know, from multi-AZ. Uh, it, you know, they are not, it's not a replacement for multi-AZ, and in fact, we see many customers who set up both. They set up uh, their primary instance as a multi-AZ instance, and they set up one or, uh, you know, more read replicas for scaling the read workloads. Uh, other important use cases for read replicas are they are a very good vehicle to do things like database upgrades, to do things like schema migrations. Uh, people who use MySQL are familiar with the challenges of uh, running you know, database migrations. Um, there are many customers who run you know, dozen to a couple of dozen database migrations a week. These require often you're adding a column or you're changing the data type of a column. These operations can be quite intensive, so some of the techniques people use are to make your read replica writable uh, and then going and applying your, uh, your uh, DDL um, on your read replica uh, and, and then cut, you know, cutting over, switching to the read replica and then going applying the DDL onto your original master. So these are techniques that people use in the MySQL community. Uh, and so read replicas, again, are useful for doing things like database upgrades and database migrations in addition for scaling read heavy workloads. Um, so the thing to be very careful when you make your read replicas writable is that um, it's, uh, you, you, know, you have to, you, you're no longer uh, actually guaranteeing, the service is no longer guaranteeing that the read replica is exactly shadowing the master. So then it's, it's really up to you to carefully use that infrastructure to work around the limitations of MySQL. 
Uh, you can also have these managed replication chains. You can go from a source to target to another target. You can have a read replica in one region and then a cross-region read replica in another region. Uh, there, are, there are limits that you can have only up to five replicas per source today. Um, uh, you can also replicate to non-RDS instances. This would not be a managed replication scenario. So we provide certain built-in stored procedures. And you can invoke those sort of stored procedures to set up external replication uh, source and targets. And so they are useful either to go from and to uh, EC2 R to RDS or on-prem to RDS. Uh, if you're using MariaDB, there are, uh, you, you can get crash-safe replication using GTIDs, global transaction identifiers. There are certain caveats to that. You must have a you know, primary key uh, on a replicated table. Uh, set the sync bin log to 1. So uh, many different options uh, with uh, MySQL and MariaDB read replicas. There are some things that we're working on in this space. One of the big asks have been uh, delayed replication. They're also called lagged replication, uh, where you can set it up so that you are guaranteeing that the replication is actually explicitly going to be behind. Uh, and the big rationale for that is, let's say you did something you know, really bad on the master by accident. You actually don't want it to go and propagate to your replica. So you can choose to keep your replica actually lag behind the master by at least some amount of time. So that's something that we're working on. Um, with Aurora, read replicas can also be used for scaling read operations and increasing availability. There are independent reader endpoints for each read replica in an Aurora cluster. It's very low latency. And so in an Aurora read replica, your replica lag is typically going to be under 20 milliseconds. It can easily be managed with uh, MySQL or MariaDB. Uh, the reader endpoints can also be used for load balancing. So you can go and talk to each individual Aurora read replica independently. But you can also get a single DNS endpoint called the reader endpoint that is used to you know, automatically balance your load amongst your set of read replicas. In fact, recently we just launched uh, last week a new feature to do auto scaling of your of your replicas, your read replicas from your reader endpoint. So you can add uh, and remove replicas on the fly. Uh, with Aurora, you can also get a logical bin log replication in addition to the Aurora replication. Logical replication is particularly useful for cross region, but also for external sources and targets. And again, if you're going to an external source or target, you would use the exact same store procedures I just described previously. Um, Multi-threaded replication is something that, um, since Aurora MySQL is still on 5.6, has a lot of caveats. There are cases which don't work well, so we recommend a lot of due diligence before using uh, multi-threaded replication uh, with 5.6 based engines. Uh, uh, Brian already did a demo for uh, showing CloudWatch metrics. So you know you would have uh, various metrics that are there of the underlying instance. Uh, with, uh, with Aurora MySQL, there are many uh, additional metrics. In addition, in, in not just host level metrics, you get things like uh, DML throughput and commit throughput, commit latency. Uh, you get um, you know, many more metrics, which we are also planning to add to RDS MySQL and RDS MariaDB. Enhanced monitoring is uh, something which gives you one to 60 second granularity on various uh, host level metrics. Uh, and also is something you can take the, the logs from enhanced monitoring and push it to CloudWatch, um, to CloudWatch logs, and you can also integrate various third party tools. Uh, RDS Performance Insights is something new that we announced last year. It's now available for Aurora Postgres. It's coming uh, to Aurora MySQL. Uh, and also the MySQL family engines. Uh, and the basic idea is that you get to measure your current load, the database load, in terms of the num you know, your current active sessions. And it's useful to really qu quickly and easily identify your sources of bottlenecks. You can try to get the, you know, the actual weight events that are, that are your source of contention. Uh, you can figure out which C uh, SQL queries are actually taking uh, most amount of time. You can do the analysis over old, wider time windows or the latest data uh, and, and really drill into what is causing performance issues. Uh, so, you know, this is, like I said before, it's coming soon for all the MySQL family database engines. Is there a timeline on that? 
Uh, we, the question was, is there a timeline for that? Uh, we don't yet have uh, an official timeline for uh, you know, all the MySQL engines, uh, but for uh, you know, Aurora MySQL, it'll be very soon. That's a good question. Brian, is, do you know pricing for performance insights? Um, so there'll be a default time frame just included with every RDS instance, um, and we may offer additional options in the future. But right now, it's just included with okay. with RDS for enhanced monitoring pricing. Yes. Yeah. Oh, enhanced. So enhanced monitoring doesn't cost anything extra, except that um, it uses CloudWatch logs. So if you're keeping um, a lot of granular by the second, then you may exceed the free tier of CloudWatch logs. Um, Usually about uh, 10 to 15 instances will, will be uh, completely free, included in the CloudWatch uh, logs. So, uh, and at lower granularities, it, it doesn't really fill up logs at all. So another piece of functionality that is available for the managed MySQL family is the audit functionality. Uh, MariaDB produced the uh, audit plugin and you know that's an open source uh, component that is uh, provided as part of MySQL 5.6 and 5.7, and MariaDB 10.0 and 10.1, and uh, it was modified uh, pretty extensively for Aurora. So the audit plugin is used to generate audit trails, and you can you can specify the specific kinds of events you want these trails for. You can say I only want it for DDL events. You can say I want it for all events. Uh, I want it for you know DMLs or DCLs where you're talking about grant and revoke privileges. Mm, so it's a bit, in a sense, it's a bit like turning on your general log. Right? You can turn on your general log today, but with uh, the audit plugin, you can be more granular in specifying exactly what you want logged. You can choose uh, inclusion lists or exclusion lists of specific users uh, that you want to have or not have in the audit plugin, <coughs> in the audit trails. Um, these uh, audit logs, along with slow query logs and general query logs in um, Aurora, they are now, we have the ability to push that to CloudWatch. That is coming for the RDS MySQL engine family also. Now, uh, the way to enable the audit plugin on the RDS MySQL and RDS MariaDB family is using an option group. Uh, in Aurora, there is just a parameter group you can use to turn on the audit. Now, turning on audit has a performance cost because effectively for every query, every event, there is an event that is every query or every statement, there's actually an event that is being written out, buffered and written out to disk. Um, and so you should be careful in testing the impact before turning on audit, especially if you're auditing everything. You know, I think uh, when in, in Aurora, if the original MariaDB audit plugin code would have almost a 40 to 50 percent impact, the Aurora version of the audit plugin was heavily optimized. So in the Aurora version, you can even have 500,000 events a second and turn on full the turn on the audit plugin, and you'll still be able to sustain it. So you know, even there, there's a cost because. You, the, without the audit plugin, you could get to, say, 600,000 600, events per second. Uh, and with all the optimizations, we can still get up to 500,000 events a second. So it doesn't come for free. Be aware of what you're signing up for by, when you turn it on. And uh, that gets me to the end of uh, our session. We have uh, time for about 10 minutes for questions. Five minutes, I think. Five minutes for questions. Yeah.